Well, thank you so much, Allison. And let me just thank everybody from the 37th Congressional District. Thank you so much for jumping on this call. You know, I will still tell you I'm glad to do these calls, but I sure miss our in-person town halls, and I certainly hope we can at least do one or two more before the end of the year. But this is a very, very special day. Uh, one, for me, it's very special because of one of my favorite, most respected Congress members has joined us, Jamie Raskin, and I'll introduce him in a minute. But I will tell you, being in D.C. last week just seemed monumental, and I'm sure uh, Congressman Raskin felt the same way. You know, one, to have the Supreme Court kind of looming over us, knowing that they were going to come up with this horrific decision, but keeping our fingers crossed that maybe they would see the light, especially given all of the protests that happened after the um, draft leaked, hoping that they would see that that's not what the American people want. And then to have the decision on guns happening at the exact same time when we were working on legislation to do the very opposite. And you know, we're very fortunate in California and in LA, we do have tough very tough gun laws. But until we bring guns under control nationwide, we'll still have problems here because we know that guns come in from other places. And so it was a monumental uh, week. And so I asked my colleague, Jamie Raskin, if he would come on and speak to you. You know, I serve on the Judiciary Committee, and I, I joke with Jamie, and I told him, I said, Jamie, if you were be my law professor for three years, I'd go to law school because I just have to tell you that when he speaks in that committee, everybody stops and listens because not only is he going to say something that's very important, but he's also going to teach us U.S. history and teach us about the Constitution at the same time. And I'm so proud of him to be on the January 6th committee and to have been one of the impeachment managers. And he gets assignments like that because that's the way all of us in Congress view him. So I asked him if he would come and if he would talk about the Supreme Court. And, and Representative Raskin, I, I would really appreciate it if, if you would do your, your professor, professorial, um, uh, you know, the way you go about talking about history. And maybe you could talk a little bit about where the Supreme Court is now. I'm beginning to call it the Republican Supreme Court because it seems as though they've gone way off into right field. But maybe you could set a bigger context with where the Supreme Court is and the decisions that came down, but also, unfortunately, what we can probably expect in the future. So let me just welcome you to Los Angeles. One of these days we'll get you here in person. And just thank you so much. It's three hours later, so, you know, for – Representative Raskin, it's 9 o'clock at night, and I really appreciate you giving us the time. Hmm. Representative Raskin. Well, uh, but it would be fine for me to do it at midnight for you, Congresswoman Bass. Uh, anything for you and for the good people of the 37th District of California who have sent you uh, to Washington to represent them and to really represent the whole country in terms of the fantastic values and priorities you bring to Congress. So I'm happy to do it. Uh, I don't blame you for calling it um, the uh, the Republican court. I think you said I would just call it the Trump court because it's three justices who are put on um, each in a rather strange way. Um, Gorsuch um, and Amy Coney Barrett and then um, uh, my constituent, um, whose, well, whose name I prefer not to utter, but you know who he is. Um, those three uh, have been the hard right swing pivot. Kavanaugh, uh, Gorsuch, and Amy Coney Barrett. Um, and, you know, they at this point, Chief Justice Roberts, who we used to think of as kind of the conservative anchor of the court, now is kind of left adrift because the five hard right conservatives on the court don't even need him. And we saw that in the abortion case where he wanted to uphold stringent anti-abortion uh, legislation without uh, overturning Roe versus Wade and abolishing the constitutional right to privacy as it applies to abortion. He thought that they should move somewhat more slowly, but they just threw caution to the wind and said uh, Roe versus Wade was wrong. Planned Parenthood versus Casey was wrong. These decisions uh, are not based on anything. The word abortion is not in the Constitution, which for them 
settles it, uh, although the word marriage is not in the Constitution either, and yet we do have a fundamental right to marry, and the word travel is not in the Constitution, but we have a fundamental right to travel, although that's going to be tested sorely over the coming months and years as the anti-choice states try to make it a crime for people either to leave the state for the purposes of accessing uh, abortion or helping people leave the state in order to access abortion. So we're, we're moving into uh, very tough times uh, with respect to the fundamental rights of the people. When you ask sort of about, well, where, do, where does the court stand today in terms of history? And, you know, when people ask me that, my answer is always surprising to them because I'm basically of the belief that the court is returning to its historical baseline. You know, the, the Supreme Court still has a halo from, you know, a two or three decade period around the Warren Court where it did hand down decisions like Brown versus Board and Roe versus Wade and Miranda versus Arizona and the white primary line of cases, Smith versus Allwright, Terry versus Adams cases, striking down some of the worst forms of disenfranchisement. But that really was a, a momentary deviation in the entire history of the Supreme Court. I mean, if you think about it from the beginning of the Republic, what did the Supreme Court ever do for enslaved people for the first century of our existence? And the answer is absolutely nothing other than to constitutionalize the whole system of slavery in the Dred Scott decision and find that um, a, an enslaved person who made it into free territory could not even uh, get into federal court under the diversity jurisdiction clause because an African-American, a descendant of slaves, could never be a citizen within the meaning of the Constitution, said Chief Justice Taney, alas, of uh, the great state of Maryland. Um, and he said the Constitution was a white man's compact, and that was the original intent and the original meaning of the Constitution. This was probably the first great appearance of originalism in, uh, in our jurisprudence. And then even after the Civil War, with the addition of the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th abolishing slavery, the 14th giving us equal protection due process, the 15th forbidding race discrimination and voting, even with all of that, the Supreme Court in 1896 upheld the whole system of Jim Crow apartheid in Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, and that is what lasted all the way up until Brown versus Board and these few decades of the Supreme Court standing with the rights of the people. But, you know, the I think that, that liberal people have fallen out of love with the Supreme Court as it has returned in the Burger Court, the Rehnquist Court, and now the Roberts Court back to that historic baseline of being a profoundly conservative and reactionary institution. And we saw it this week. Um, in, of course, the abortion decision, Hobbs, and we saw it in uh, the gun decision that you referenced about concealed carry. And we saw it today again in an absurd decision, really bulldozing the Establishment Clause, upholding the right of a school employee, a football coach, to conduct religious prayers at the 50-yard line while he's at work, on work time, inviting students to participate on the grounds that that is his free exercise of religion. When the school said, hey, we'll give you your own room, your own space and locker room, you can go pray, you can go off and do your own thing, but you can't uh, lead the students in prayer, um, which is something the Supreme Court has been holding for decades now. Um, so we're in a full-blown reactionary assault on the constitutional freedoms that the Warren Court tried to enunciate. And, and Representative Raskin, um, one question, actually I could throw a few questions to you, but one question is, does this, can this automatically lead to taking away other rights? And where can we get like a list of all of the rights that were done under the Warren Court so we'll know what we should start organizing about now? So, well, if we start with the constitutional right to privacy, um, you can pretty much follow uh, Justice Clarence Thomas's um, opinion in the case because he lays out a roadmap. Roe versus Wade was based on a series of privacy, uh, right to privacy decisions. Um, Griswold versus Connecticut, 
um, back in 1965, had struck down a ban on access to contraception in Connecticut, uh, even for married people. And the Supreme Court said, no, there is a constitutional right to privacy, um, both in the due process clause, due process liberty, but also through the accumulation of the other rights that exist in the Bill of Rights, including the right against unreasonable searches and seizures in the Fourth Amendment, the privilege against self-incrimination in the Fifth Amendment, the right against cruel and unusual punishment. Um, Justice Douglas basically said that there has to be a constitutional right to privacy in the Constitution. And the Ninth Amendment says that the enumeration of particular rights shall not be construed to disparage or deny the other rights retained by the people. And, of course, that's exactly the project that this court, um, you know, is involved in. So um, the right to contraception, um, the right against sterilization, Skinner versus Oklahoma, I mean, if you think about it, if you have no right to privacy such that the government can tell you you can't have an abortion, the government can also compel you to have an abortion or compel you to be sterilized, as of course it did to tens of thousands of women in the last century. A lot of them in Virginia, but in a whole bunch of states, um, people were sterilized against their will. And when it was finally struck down, it was based on the idea of a right of privacy and integrity in your own reproductive and procreative decisions. So uh, that's gone. And then, of course, the... Um, the rights of marriage are also uh, flowing out of this right to privacy, most recently in the Obergefell decision, which struck down bans on uh, gay people getting married. And the court there, you know, stated that gay people have as much of a right to um, make intimate decisions about their sexuality, about how they're going to order their lives as anybody else. Um, so all of that um, could fall as the dominoes get pushed backwards, which is precisely what Justice Thomas is asking for. He, you know, people have been observing that he didn't talk about Loving versus Virginia, which also right. is arguably implicated by this because it is the right to marry, uh, you know, ag <clears throat> against attempts by the state to block marriage based on race. And so he might say, oh, well, that violates equal protection. Well, not on the test that he developed uh, in any of these cases, because if you go back to the 14th oh, Amendment, 18, 1868, there were certainly bans on interracial marriage um, in states throughout the country. Um, and in fact, the argument that was made by Virginia in Loving versus Virginia was that there was no race discrimination at all because black people couldn't marry white people and white people couldn't marry black people. And so nobody's <laughs> discriminated against. And uh, the court accepted, you know, the, the court, some of the justices accepted that argument. And without the idea of a fundamental right to choose your own partner and order your own uh, romantic and reproductive life, none of it uh, does make any sense. You could fall for sophistry uh, like that. Of course, it is an expression of white supremacy, but it results in this massive violation of people being able to marry the person they want to. Um, Representative Raskin, I want to ask you, there's a few questions here for you. If you don't mind, I think I'm going to send them to, you know, rattle off a few. Um, so one is, uh, uh, what are your thoughts on expanding the court to 13 justices? And um, also, what could be done about Clarence, uh, about Justice Thomas and the other justices that lied during their uh, confirmation hearing? Um, and I think that, oh, uh, Delaware is one of the states where abortion is still legal. How can we protect those who come to our state? It's the same with California. By the way, when you were talking about sterilization, that was a big problem in California, too, and uh, primarily targeting uh, African-American and Latina uh, women. Yeah, well, first about expanding the court, um, the – the number of justices is not fixed in the Constitution. It's always been up to Congress. It's changed, um, when I looked at this, I can't remember if it's nine or ten times. I think it's nine different times uh, the numbers have been changed. Of course, it's a controversial uh, thing to do, as Franklin Roosevelt found out with his 
um, court packing scheme, but it, it did achieve the desired political effect as, um, you know, the, the court ended up um, finally backing off of its invalidation of all the New Deal legislation. Um, but it's a controversial thing to do. I think it should be a little less controversial today, given that, um, you know, the whole purpose of life tenure um, was to make sure the justices would be independent of political pressure and coercion. But of course, these justices are, you know, just political robots for the uh, Republican Party. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, when life tenure was established, the average age and the, the average life expectancy mm-hmm. in the country was around, you know, 67 or 70 years old. I mean, today, you know, people are living in 90, 95, 100. Someone could be on the Supreme Court for 50 years or, you know, oh 50 God. years. Um, and so I think there's a, there's a lot a lot more rationale for real reform of that system today, um, and I think it's something that it's worth us talking about. I don't have any illusions that we're going to be able to make that happen as long as the Senate is in its current configuration with a 50-50 split and the filibuster hanging over everything like the guillotine, you know. Um, so the, the only reason that I'm not like way out there on this right now is just I don't see it going anywhere and uh, the right wing has found it a useful thing to to rally against the truth is that they've been the experts at court packing and uh, you know it was Mitch McConnell who said no we're not going to have President Obama's pick Merrick Garland even considered in a hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee that's our counterpart over in the, the Senate we're not even going to give him a hearing because 10 and a half months is too close to an election, and we want the people to decide. And then when uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat opened up just, um, you know, a couple months before the election, they hustled to get um, Amy Coney Barrett, um, you know, who's like a character from The Handmaid's Tale. Um, they get her <laughs> hearing just, you know, a couple months before and then she's voted on four weeks before the election when when voting had already begun in a whole bunch of states there was already voting going on so it was you know an absolutely maddening uh hypocritical double standard and i consider that seat a a stolen supreme court seat um where they denied merrick garland who the whole country knows now as attorney general an opportunity to get an up or down vote. We're talking about the chief of the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, you know. So there's all kinds of questions about the legitimacy of this court, both its decisions, which are absurd, but also how it came to be structured in the way that it is. So I, I'm open to that. You know, on what can, what can we do now? In other words, what what can we do with with Roe? Is there a possibility that that decision can be overturned? Well, um, they've they've interpreted the Constitution in a binding way. Of course, we have the power under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment to the extent that the Supreme Court doesn't try to chop away at it. But we do have the power under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment to um, enforce and protect the rights of the people. So, you know, Karen, we passed the Women's Health Protection Act. It was back in March, I think, when we passed it. We tried to codify Roe versus Wade and guarantee uh, the right of choice and even make it civilly actionable if your government, try, your state government tries to take that right away from you. Um, but uh, we passed it in the House and it's gone nowhere uh, in the Senate. So theoretically, we could reestablish a woman's right to choose by federal law. By the same token, they can do what they want to do, which is to ban abortion nationwide. And Vice President Pence, um, who I I confess I have lionized a little bit because of his doing his job and adhering to his oath on January 6th, he has nonetheless come out for um, a federal uh, criminal ban on abortion in every state so that You know, California and Maryland will not even be free choice states that women can gravitate to if, you know, they need to seek medical attention um, for an unwanted or dangerous pregnancy or 
you know, a pregnancy caused by rape or incest or what have you. So, um, you know, that, that's where we are. I mean, the country uh, is, you know, as divided as we've been, we are now going to be that much more divided between free choice states and basically theocratic states where, you know, somebody's imposing, uh, you know, a theological straitjacket on other people's healthcare decisions. Um, the other part of the question uh, that, you, that you asked me, Congresswoman Bass, was about, well, what about these people who went into senators' offices and lied? You know, what, what right. about, you know, what about right. Gorsuch going in or Kavanaugh? Uh, God, I hate to utter his name, but anyway, what, 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 what about the people going in? And then, and then they say, well, yes, I do um, Roe versus Wade to settled precedent. I believe in stare decisis and so on. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, uh, you know, I don't know that there's much that can be done about that. I mean, and even just leaving aside, um, you know, the, the proposition that most of these conservative judges are going to be people, people who lie about it and people know that. But they will say, well, I didn't lie. I just said it was settled precedent, which, is, which it was until we overturned it. And I believe in stare decisis, but I don't believe in it as they wrote in the majority decision in Hobbes, I don't believe in it categorically and absolutely. I just believe in it as a presumption. So that there will be ways for them to wiggle and worm their way out of it. Um, but there's no doubt that they, you know, tried to pull the wool over people's eyes. On the other hand, I got to say, for some of these senators who are acting just shocked, shocked that they would do this, I think they allowed themselves to have the wool pulled over their eyes because it's not as if, we weren't the women's caucus in the House as if the pro-choice movement wasn't screaming from the rooftops. These people are going to overturn Roe versus Wade. I mean, that's the whole purpose of the Republican National Committee platform for the last several decades, right up until 2020, when they didn't even pass a platform because their platform is whatever Donald Trump tells them. You know. And, and you know, uh, Representative Raskin, I get tired of listening to Susan Collins being shocked. She's shocked all the time. You know, when she makes decisions. Well, I know that um, we have a poll question that we want to ask people, and then I want to switch and have you talk about January 6th, because we're getting lots of questions about January 6th. Uh, one person did ask me, though, California has set aside money for people from other states to come here, and the question was, is that taxpayers' money? Yes, that's taxpayers' money. Um, but can we ask the poll question now, whether people agree with the decisions of the Supreme Court? Yes, absolutely. So very simply, everyone, we have great audience on. If you agree with the Supreme Court overturning um, Roe v. Wade, is this the one you want to do for sure, Congresswoman? Uh, sure, yeah. Okay. Okay, press one for yes and two for no. So, again, if you agree with the Supreme Court Overturning Roe v. Wade, press one for yes, I agree. Press two for no, you disagree. So again, one last time I'll read through that, just in case I confused everyone. Do you agree with the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade? Press one for yes and two for no. Everyone can continue to weigh in on that while I turn it back to you, Congresswoman. So, Congressman, Everybody is just so proud of the job that you and and our chairman have been doing on the January 6th committee. And I don't know if you're able to tell us, but if there's a little hint, hint about this emergency hearing that's called tomorrow. But I think one of the biggest questions that people are asking in the queue is, what is going to happen? Is Garland going to prosecute? What is going to happen? Well, on that question, the first thing I, I must confess, um, dear Karen, is that Merrick Garland is my constituent, so I tend not to like to beat up on my constituents in public. Um, so I, I don't want anything I say to be interpreted as pressure on you. But look, uh, they brought more than 850 prosecutions against people for everything from assaulting a federal officer to trespass uh, in a federal building, to interference with a federal proceeding, all the way up to uh, seditious conspiracy, which means conspiracy to overthrow 
uh, or put down or destroy the government of the United States. So um, I don't think they're being shy. It is true they are working their way up the way you do in an organized crime prosecution. Um, you start with the smaller fish and you get them to tell you about the people at the level above them and so on until you work, you work, you know, work your way to the top. Um, but look, what, what are the criteria in the DOJ in the DOJ um, charging um, principles? Well, you look to obviously you look to see if there's probable cause that a crime has been committed. I think that our hearings have shown probable cause about a number of crimes uh, being committed all the way to the top, including conspiracy to deprive the public of an honest election, including conspiracy to interfere with the federal proceeding. Um, but once you determine that there's probable cause, that's not enough. You have to look at the gravity of the offense. You've got to look at whether there's important deterrent value um, in doing it. And you have to look at the culpability or the intentionality with which um, the potential defendant acted. And I think if you look at each one of those things, um, all of them argue for indictment. But I don't want to go much further than that because, I mean, I know people are impatient and I know people want to see justice. To me, it's a beautiful thing to see people want, you know, hungering for justice in an individual case like that. Um, but, you know, our goal in the committee is not just individual criminal accountability. That's the Department of Justice's real jurisdiction. Ours is collective accountability for preserving our democracy and fortifying democratic institutions against coups, against insurrections, against political violence, and against uh, people trying to perpetrate frauds on the election. And that, to me, is really more important where, than where Donald Trump spends the remaining years of his life. And, uh, you know, I, I care a lot more about our democracy and the future of, um, you know, what America is going to look like for our children and grandchildren than I do about him. But having said that, I want justice, too. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm willing to wait for it because I think that they will do the right thing. So here's two questions for you. Um, I noticed that the January 6th committee hearings are still being dismissed as partisan. And I'm wondering if it's being considered to have a member of the Capitol Police list every injury that was suffered, since that clearly wasn't partisan. How does one, well, I just did, the question was, how do you submit that idea for to a committee member? Uh, and that's exactly well, what we did. Well, one more question. The committee is um, bringing in new evidence. Um, and so one question is, um, let's see, are you going to, are you going to be questioning uh, Clarence Thomas's wife regarding her role in playing a part in trying to overthrow our government? And what does that do with him being able to stay on the Supreme Court? All right. Well, let's start with number one. First of all, consider that idea submitted because I love that idea. It's an idea uh, actually that I was pushing from the beginning. We need to have the names of all of the officers uh, who were injured or wounded or took their own lives um, in, um, you know, in response to these events. Um, and we should have a complete listing of all of the broken ribs, broken vertebrae, broken arms, traumatic brain injuries, concussions, um, lost fingers, heart attacks, strokes. So thank you to whoever put that. That person is a, a, a small D Democrat after my own heart. And please consider that something that I'm working on too. Um, so um, so that's question number one. Question number two um, about Ginny Thomas. Well, um, Ginny Thomas um, has expressed her interest in speaking to the committee. Um, and I, for one, as a member of the committee, am very interested in talking to her. I think all of us are. We're interested in speaking to all material witnesses who have evidence relevant to what happened both in terms of the inside political coup, uh, you know, the shakedown against election officials, uh, state legislatures, the Department of Justice, the counterfeit electors plot, um, as well as the violent insurrection, which ended up merging in uh, the final hours with the political coup. So we're interested in anybody who's got information. She clearly is somebody uh, who was 
uh, involved with various actors um, here. And so we want to hear from her. Um, you know, the the problem on the Supreme Court is that, um, you know, as Congressman Bass will, will tell you, there is no binding uh, ethics rules against the Supreme Court justices themselves. They are literally the judge in their own case, which is what Madison defined um, as uh, anathema to a system of the rule of law. I mean, he basically said the cardinal principle in our rule of uh, law is that nobody can be a judge in their own cause, by which he meant their own case. Um, and yet that's exactly how it works on the Supreme Court. You know, if you say, oh, well, I don't have a conflict, then that's it. That's not how it works for judges in any other part of the federal system. So uh, Congresswoman Bass and I have been pushing for the adoption of a real uh, ethics uh, code on the Supreme Court. And, you know, I mean, Justice Thomas voted in the minority eight to one um, in the case of Donald Trump versus Thompson versus our committee. Everybody else voted that um, that all of the materials needed to be turned over from the archives to us and that Trump, you know, could not uh, block that by asserting executive privilege. And Thomas was the only one uh, to dissent. And, you know, it's possible within those materials, there are communications from his own wife. But if he thinks that there's no conflict of interest in that, then there's no conflict of interest because they've got no system. So we got to deal with that problem. And, you know, as for what it means for him on the court, likely it doesn't mean much unless, you know, far more egregious and outrageous things come out, in which case there's only one potential remedy, which is uh, impeachment. But then, you know, again, you're back into the House Senate system, which, of course, I became so familiar with during the presidential impeachment. I mean, you need a majority in the House uh, to impeach, but you need two thirds in the Senate in order to convict. And we, we did have a 57 to 43 majority, but that wasn't enough to convict Trump. He beat the constitutional spread by by 10 votes. Um, Raskin, if there was an impeachment of a, a judge, would it be just like each of the president? Yeah. Would it be done in the same fashion? Yeah, they're, they're all they're all done in the exact same way, and um, yeah. And when was the last time a judge was impeached? Well, the, you know that there have been that that's actually not that infrequent. I mean, um, there are district judges that have been impeached recently. There's a famous case called Nixon versus United States, and it's not that Nixon. It's not the California Nixon. It's uh, Walter Nixon, uh, who was a judge uh, from North Carolina. But that was the case which actually established that the procedures adopted by the House and the Senate are a political question, which means the Supreme Court will not uh, review and scrutinize the procedures adopted in the impeachment process. That's up to the, you know, the coordinate branch of government, the legislative branch, to determine those rules. Oh, what about the um, the pro prosecution, or rather, I should say, the investigation of Trump in Georgia and in New York? Both of those attorney generals. I mean, it is possible that they prosecute him. Correct. Well, um, the country got to see the extremely damning evidence against Donald Trump coming out of Georgia, where, you know, he said, all I'm looking for is 11,780 votes, which was Donald Trump not trying to stop election fraud. It was Donald Trump trying to commit election fraud and getting caught red handed because Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, who's a loyal, lifelong Republican who contributed to the Trump campaign, uh, was so outraged by all of the intimidation that he decided to tape the conversation. Um, and that's where, you know, Donald Trump was clearly found trying to solicit um, the Secretary of State's involvement in what is a criminal conspiracy to fabricate votes. So, you know, while he's out there saying he's trying to stop election fraud, which more than 60 courts determined did not exist anywhere in the land, he was actually trying to commit election fraud. Thank you. Um, 
you know, we, we talked a lot about Roe, but not so much about uh, the gun legislation. And maybe you could talk about what the court did versus what we did. Well, there was a challenge to New York's concealed carry law, which required people to show that they had some special purpose for wanting to carry a concealed weapon. Uh, and you can imagine why um, a city is densely compact, as New York would want to make sure that people have a special reason uh, that can be publicly articulated before they're carrying a gun with them on the subway or the bus or the streets or whatever. But the court struck it down, implicating the laws of a whole bunch of states, including Maryland, where we also have a similar process where you have to show a special reason um, in order to get uh, concealed carry. Either, you know, you're being threatened by someone and you're in fear of your uh, safety or it's part of your job as a, you know, a security guard or whatever it might be. But now all of that is struck down. The court says um, that um, this comes within the Second Amendment right, and um, there's not a sufficiently compelling reason that the state could use uh, to overcome it. So there is so much that's problematic with the constitutional reasoning and the methodology in this uh, decision. Um, it, you know, it's very clear that states have had laws like this for a long time. And if you had any kind of real appreciation for original intent in history, you would have to find that the states are doing the right thing. But the court just says, well, no, actually that practice collides with the text of the Second Amendment. Now, the text of the Second Amendment, of course, has been disputed, um, well, certainly since the Heller decision. But for the longest time, it was accepted that the individual's right to carry, to bear arms, was connected to service in the militia, the public militia, or what today we would call the National Guard. And the language of it is a well-regulated militia being necessary to the survival of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, in Heller versus District of Columbia, uh, the liberals said, you have a right to, to bear arms constitutionally with respect to militia service. The court rejects that and says that the so-called prefatory clause, clause uh, a well-regulated militia, is not actually linked to the operative clause. The right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So, so Justice Scalia just detached the two, which is the strangest grammar in the world. Um, and um, but, but even there, I got to say, there was a 5-4 decision. Even if you accept what the conservatives said, still Justice Scalia is saying in that, decision that the individual's right to keep and bear arms um, is conditioned on uh, reasonable regulation by the state in the interest of public safety and public security, like every other right. I mean, the free speech right in the First Amendment is subject to reasonable time, place, manner restrictions. You've got a right to protest across from the White House um, in Farragut Park, but not at two o'clock in the morning with the loudest uh, speaker system in the world because the people inside the White House have a right to sleep. So every right has got to be cabined by the um, acceptance of neighboring rights and, you know, competing social interests. And Scalia was very clear about that. And he said, you know, th none of this should be seen to cast doubt on background checks, on uh, rejection of the right to carry guns into sensitive public places, government buildings and schools or denial of the right to carry arms to people who are convicted felons or otherwise proven dangerous and so on. And the, you know, you know, our colleagues, Karen, they just read that out of the second amendment. So anything that we want to do, they say it violates the second amendment and we're, and they say, you want to repeal the second amendment. And I just say, no, we don't want to repeal the second amendment. We just want you to read the second amendment and read the, the court's decisions about it. And, you know, we, there is a reasonable gun safety regulation, um, you know, codicil to the idea of people having a right to, to weapons for self-defense and for hunting and recreation. Well, you know, the, the problem with what you just said is, is that the key word was read. And um, I don't think we have expectations of some of our colleagues actually do that, which is quite sad. 
Um, one person is asking, uh, and by the way, I want you to know that you have some fans of your book, Unthinkable. There's a, a book club in Westwood where they're reading your book, and, uh, <laughs> and they, <laughs> they want to know about it. Um, so one question is, how can it be left up to states to decide on abortion but not left up to states to decide on the right to carry guns in public? Um, can't the state – because in California, of course, you can't carry – uh, a weapon in public. I thought that the state still had some control. Well, right, you are. I mean, I think that that irony has not been lost on millions of people who can't believe that the whole rhetoric of uh, over, overturning Roe versus Wade is let's let the states decide. They're the ones who know their interests best and the values of the people best and so on. But when it comes to guns, no, we need the absolute straitjacket of NRA orthodoxy handed down by, you know, uh, Justice Alito and Justice Thomas um, and these guys. And there, you know, all the state's rights rhetoric goes out the window. Um, it's completely expedient. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's I think, a, a very powerful insight. Hello to my friends in Westwood. Thank you for reading my book, Unthinkable, and Send me a note when it's all over, if you would, and let me know what you guys thought about it. And if you guys send that to my office, I will make sure Representative Raskin uh, gets it. Um, you know, I, I will say that in, in California and in, in Los Angeles specifically, we do have red flag laws. Uh, and red flag laws mean if, you, uh, if there's somebody that you're concerned about either being a danger to themselves or other people, that, that their right to uh, have a gun can be taken away from them. But um, the problem in, in L.A. is that nobody uses it. I mean, I think there were like 25 requests. So one of the things that we need to do is to make sure that people in L.A. are aware of that. And I don't know if there's anything else you want to comment about what we passed versus what the president just signed versus what uh, the court did and if there's any contradiction in that. Well, <clears throat> The, my main frustration is just that the most obvious things are not happening. Um, and I'm not talking about radical things in any way. I mean, what we have in, the, you know, the, the, uh, the Brady Act, the idea of a background check, but we've got these gaping loopholes in the background check. I mean, if you go to a gun store, they're going to run a background check on you to make sure you're not, you're not a criminal and you're, uh, you know, you, you're not disqualified because of insanity and you're not a fugitive and you're, you know, a whole bunch of things. But if you go on the Internet to buy one, you don't have to have that. If you go to a, a gun show, there's no background check. So that doesn't make any sense. That's not that's not a real law. That's like Swiss cheese, you know. And so when we say a universal violent criminal background check, all we're saying is, close the loopholes. More than 90% of the American people accept that everybody should have a background check before they're purchasing a firearm. So, you, you know, uh, so that that's one thing that we had in that the Senate did not do because the NRA draws a hard line on that. And, you know, our friends in the Republican Party are just captive to that NRA dogma. Um, you know, we also wanted to ban the high capacity magazines. You don't need high-capacity magazines either to defend yourself uh, or to go hunting. I mean, hunters look down on somebody who would bring a high-capacity magazine. In fact, in, both in federal law and state law, it's, it's against the law to have high-capacity magazines when you're out duck hunting or whatever. But it's not against the law if you want to go pick up an AR-15 in order to go into a school and start shooting it up. And, you know, what we just saw what happened um, in Uvalde was an 18-year-old who gets an AR-15 on his 18th birthday and then goes in and assassinates all of those children. And we saw the same thing in Buffalo. An 18-year-old got jacked up on racist great white replacement theory and went into the black community and found the supermarket and just started killing people. Um, and so... The, you know, our colleagues across the aisle basically are telling us that um, these are necessary human sacrifices to the Second Amendment. There's nothing that can be done under the Second Amendment to stop that. And, I, you know, I just don't accept 
that the Second Amendment means that we have to allow weapons of war to be carried in the streets, much less sold to 18-year-olds. You know, I tell you, it was just so devastating to me to hear about the damage, the physical damage that an AR-15 does. It just broke my heart, the idea that the parents had to have DNA in order for their kids to be, um, you know, identified. You know, um, Representative Raskin, a whole other area that the Supreme Court took up, which, you know, as, as we fought so hard for police reform and we were able to get it done in the House but not in the Senate, but the decision around Miranda, um, you know, what, what, what does that do? A, a question that someone has written in is uh, how should citizens respond to police officers who don't read them their Miranda rights? What course of action should citizens take if this happens? And the Supreme Court also made a decision. I don't think this was connected to Miranda, but where you can't – or maybe it was – where you can't sue um, – they uh, uh, restricted additional restrictions on how you can sue officers? Well, yes, indeed. Um, the, yeah. Uh, well, that's one of the things we've tried to deal with in, in your legislation, uh, where you know, we're reforming all of these uh, judge-made immunity doctrines that uh, let police departments and officers off the hook. Um, if they've engaged in a certain kind of brutality or injustice that's never happened before. Um, and then they say, well, you know, this is a, a novel thing. There's no way anybody could have known, um, which is just an extraordinary, you know, made up doctrine. Um, so, you know, we've got, we've got a lot of work to do on that. And there are, um, you know, police departments that, uh, you know, that need reform, and I, I like very much the stuff that we put into the, the George Floyd Act um, to try to reform uh, a lot of these practices. But, um, you know, as, as you know, the point is not in any way to uh, abolish the police. On the contrary, I mean, the police, I know, saved a lot of lives on January 6th, and there were a lot of African-American and Hispanic officers who were out there that day, like my constituent Officer Dunn or Officer Gunnell, who saved our lives battling uh, in under medieval conditions white supremacists and white nationalists and proud boys and oath keepers who came with the express object of overthrowing the government and killing uh, political leadership and even hanging Mike Pence. And if they were going to hang Mike Pence, I tremble to think what they would have done to Congresswoman Karen Bass or to me if they'd gotten our hands on us. So, um, you know, to my mind, uh, police officers are public servants, just like teachers and firefighters and members of city councils and uh, members of Congress and so on. And I know that there are certain departments, just like there's certain other kinds of offices in different parts of the country that have been infected by racism, but we got to deal with that at the same time that we make the proper investment in training um, and uh, education and support for our officers. I and mean, that's just the way I feel about it. Well, a a absolutely. You know, back to uh, Ro, um, what about a, a woman who has an atopic pregnancy? Um, what, 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 what happens then? Well, this is one of the extraordinary things. I mean, I, I thought that where they would end up would be, well, we're against the vast majority of abortions of just women making their own decisions, but we will allow exceptions for uh, health of the mother, for rape, for incest. They decided to go the other way they, because basically they, they arrived at the conclusion that if we allow exceptions for rape, health of the mother, and so on, well, then health of the mother opens up to psychological or emotional health of the mother. And, uh, you know, women could lie about whether or not they were, they were raped. And so they just decided to go all the way and say, no, we're going to ban it. I mean, it's handmade tale stuff. Uh, and uh, th that's where the extreme anti-choice movement is. And they cast their lot with those people. I mean, forget all the rhetoric about we're just going to let the people of the States decide. I mean, Within 24 hours of the decision, they already started calling for a national ban on abortion, criminalizing it everywhere, not just in, you know, 
Texas and Mississippi and Arkansas, but all over the country. Uh, and, of course, that, that is the logic of their position. I mean, if you think what is, was a constitutional right last week is murder now, then, of course, it's murder all over the country. So I've got a resolution, which I'm introducing tomorrow, um, to uh, uphold the constitutional right to travel, which also is not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution, but it's been considered part of the Constitution for more than a century, so that women are allowed to leave a particular state to go to another state for the purposes of receiving medical care that is lawful in the destination state. And, uh, you know, we, we need to start fighting real hard on that principle that any state that tries to keep women from traveling or criminalizing people who enable their travel, um, those states are interfering with people's exercise of their civil rights under Section 1983 and are violating people's civil rights. But this is going to become, I think, real quickly, a very big terrain of conflict. And, you know, I think about an atopic pregnancy or a tubular pregnancy, as, it, as it's called. If you don't end that immediately, it can burst and the woman will die because there's no way a pregnancy in a woman's fallopian tubes can be viable at all. And so I, I can just ima- I can't imagine as a former medical professional, I can't imagine that a doctor would actually sit there and allow a tubular pregnancy to explode. But then on the other hand, you know, there's women in Central America, for example, and other countries that get arrested when they have miscarriage because who's to say that you didn't cause the miscarriage? It's just, you know, the 21st century in year 2022, and it's just shocking to see how far uh, backwards we could go. And, you know, uh, Jamie, what's to say that separate but equal won't come back? I mean, you know, who's to say that the businessman shouldn't say who comes in? restaurant and where that person should sit. They should be free to have their their business conducted any way that they want. Well, th- there you go. Wait, first on that topic, pregnancy, I mean, you're totally right. The questioner's um, totally right about that. There are lots of women who miscarry and then take what is an abortion drug at the direction of their doctor in order to, you know, clear their bodies um, completely of the miscarriage. Well, that that would be made illegal, just like with the ectopic pregnancy. I mean, you know, which is why we've said from the beginning, the question is, who is going to decide these issues? Is it women with their partners and families and their physicians and other medical personnel? Or is it politicians? You, you know, do you want the state legislators or the congressmen? You want Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert and Matt Gates? and Jim Jordan making these decisions about, you know, uh, ectopic pregnancies and uh, what to do um, with, you know, extraordinary deformities and all these kinds of things. And all I can say is I know a lot of women in my life, and I know a lot of politicians, and I trust the women more than I trust the politicians, including the female politicians. But, you know, on your point about, uh, you know, separate but equal and where we're headed, on all that stuff. Um, They want to turn the clock back on everything. You're totally right. Uh, I mean, the next thing is really going to be to go back to try to uh, attack the New Deal regulatory agencies. I mean, this was Steve Bannon's original target when he said, we're going to destroy the regulatory state. So we're going to destroy, you know, the EPA, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act. We don't want any regulation. we don't want the FDA. We don't want any of that stuff. They're going to – it'll be like back to the Lochner period. And then you're right. If they won't put the the race discrimination that they have inscribed into law in such explicit uh, and naked terms, but they will put it precisely, as you suggested, in terms of freedom. I mean, and that's what – you know, that's where they're going with, for example, you don't – you know, if your hotel or motel or wedding – business doesn't want to serve gay people, of course you don't have to. That violates your freedom to associate with who you want to, your religious scruples. Well, if that applies to um, same-sex couples, why doesn't that apply to interfaith couples or interracial couples? Uh, right. And then we're right back to, you know, what was being fought about in the 1960s, because, you know, the argument being made by Robert Bork around the Civil Rights Act was, 
um, you can't force a motel or restaurant owner in the South who doesn't want to serve black people to serve black people. That violates his right not to associate with the people he doesn't want to associate with. Whereas the civil rights movement said, and the Supreme Court upheld it under the Warren Court, that, that no, this is about the regulation of commerce and whether everyone is going to be able to be free to travel among the states. Uh, without white supremacy and violent white supremacy getting in the way. And that was you know, what was so critical about the Civil Rights Act, followed very quickly you know, by the Voting Rights Act in, in 65. But I, I think we are headed exactly back in that direction, and we have a, a deeply reactionary jurisprudence setting in. Well, let me just say uh, we are at the end of our hour, and I'm just so appreciative of you taking the time. I want everybody on the call to know in terms of the poll question that we asked, 94% of people do not agree with the decision that the Supreme Court made, 6% uh, do. So I think it's probably pretty representative of the constituents of the 37th District. You know, I appreciate you so much for taking the time. I know it's 10 o'clock now, and I know that all of the constituents who are on this call understand why Representative Raskin is such a well-respected and loved member of the House of Representatives. And even though these are my last few months in the House, I will absolutely miss my friend and his brilliance and his teaching. So I might have to call you up from time to time and get a history lesson Representative Rash. Thank you so much. I'm always here for you, and uh, thank you for your splendid service to the people of California. (laughs) All right. See you soon, Jamie. All the best. Bye-bye.